Great, so welcome to today's session uh, of the DFIR stream hosted by the Association of Cyber Forensics and Threat Investigators. A webinar um, series is designed to create a dynamic um, a forum for researchers, industry practitioners, and enthusiasts to share and discuss the latest in digital forensics and cybersecurity. We aim to deliver high quality lectures and seminars on cutting edge topics. Attendance is free. And for those interested in staying updated on future lectures and seminars, please join our announcement list, which already has over 850 members. Uh, please also allow me to introduce our dedicated DFIR stream team comprised of distinguished professionals who drive our initiatives forward. Our team includes myself, uh, Gabriela Marcella, um, Dr. Ahmed El Nesiri, Stefan Buchanan, Fatma Jasmin Lumachi, and Dr. Elisa Chiapponi. So the Association of Cyber Forensics and Threat Investigators is a professional body dedicated to promoting and supporting cybersecurity activities in compliance with applicable laws. Since our informal funding in 2016 and official uh, institutionalization in 2020, we've aimed to create a rich network for knowledge exchange and to inspire the next generation of cybersecurity professionals through comprehensive training and engagement. So at ACTI, we encourage our members uh, to, uh, and we encourage our members to volunteer and uh, give back to their communities, utilizing their expertise uh, where it is most needed. We are actively seeking collaborations with organizations that can offer internships and academic institutions that provide practical training. These partnerships also are crucial for providing our members with hands-on experience in cybersecurity before they graduate. So we are also excited to um, announce our uh, dedicated website for the DFRI stream. Uh, this platform will serve as the primary resource for assessing our webinars, seminars, and community engagements. It's designed to enhance your experience and ensure you have all the necessary information at your fingertips. And as you can see here from the slide, uh, we issue a certificate of participation, uh, which is uh, utilized and useful actually for uh, credit. Um, what uh, is also uh, interesting to note is that looking forward, uh, we have several exciting events on the horizon. And here we want to highlight the IEEE CSR workshop on cyber forensics and advanced threat investigation in emerging technologies, which will take place from September 2 to 4, 2024 in London. So for those interested in contributing, remember that the paper submission deadline is June 3rd. We encourage you to visit our website to learn more and consider participating. And additionally, we're always looking for guest speakers to share their expertise. So again, if you or someone you know is interested, please apply or nominate through our website. And so today we have the privilege of hearing from Shinan Liu, a final year PhD candidate in the computer science department at the University of Chicago, where he's advised by Professor Nick uh, Fimster. He earned his master's of science degree within the PhD program at the University of Chicago in 2022, and is a recipient of the Daniels Fellowship. Um, he harbors a strong interest in network systems, security, interpretable AI, and measurement, with his research often focusing on network trafficking analysis, cellular networks, the Internet of Things, and cyber physical systems. So before coming to the University of Chicago, Shannon was the CEO of a startup company called Amenity Security. 
He's a research consultant also and lagsafe.ai, and he also had internship at, internships at FedML, uh, Virginia Tech, uh, Kehoe 360, Microsoft Research Asia, NOAA, and uh, Tsinghua uh, Nils. Uh, so Shannon's research work has been recognized and published in uh, top conferences and journals such as uh, Usenix Security, Sigmetrics, Conext, and Ubicomp. Uh, additionally, his research has been featured in multiple media outlets, including Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, and, um, and many others. So um, in an era where the volume and complexity of network data are burgeoning, integrating machine learning into network operation is no longer uh, just an option, but a necessity. So our speaker, Shinan, will delve into the intricacies of deploying ML models within networking uh, environments, a task, uh, I would say, riddled with unique challenges today due to the distinct characteristics of network data. And through his talk, also, he will explore how limitations like data scarcity and concept drift can be navigated and how systems can be designed to handle vast traffic volumes um, efficiently. So please join us in welcoming Shin and Liu to present his uh, work in this uh, really fascinating field of network machine learning. So Shinan, please, the floor is yours and you can start sharing your presentation at um, any time. Yeah, thanks for the intro, uh, Gabriela. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank everyone for coming. Yeah, let me share my screen first and I can sort of get started. Cool. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes, we do. That's good, that's good. So, yeah, hi everyone. My name is Shinan. I'm the final year PhD candidate from University of Chicago. I'm very fortunate to be advised by Professor Nick Finster. And I'd also to uh, thank Dr. Ahmed Ellsbury uh, for hosting me for this talk and uh, inviting me. Yeah, for sure. So in today's talk, I'll be talking about operationalizing ML for networks. Uh, this talk summarizes my recent endeavors on uh, making machine learning more practical for networking and network security tasks. So yeah, feel free to ask me clarification questions during the talk, and we can leave like more complicated, maybe more philosophical questions in the end. So yeah. Let's get started today. Uh, we are seeing a lot of machine learning models, and they are becoming more powerful, and they are increasingly used in networking tasks. Uh, for example, network forecasting, um, service providers like Verizon, they need to predict user demand to adjust their network capacities. Uh, for example, in COVID-19 pandemic, uh, when everybody's stuck at home, uh, they need to allocate new resources to like uh, places that's close to uh, everybody's home. So essentially, they want to predict such event uh, using complex time series models. There are also many machine learning based traffic analysis systems. Um, for example, because many traffic are getting encrypted, yeah, we want to leverage very strong uh, classification models to measure quality of experience, uh, to do service recognition, to know like whether this flow is from YouTube or Netflix, and to do some security tasks like intrusion detections. Yeah, and we want to know this uh, label as soon as possible when we see the network flows. So essentially, that need to have a lot of like um, complex classification problems uh, models in there. Yeah, even for applications like activity recognition. Yeah, people can use network tra traffic to analyze sleep stages, behavioral patterns, and etc. Uh, for more like human well-being benefits. So uh, if we look at this machine learning pipeline in networks, you can see that it's uh, actually not very different from other domains. We have a historical network data set and use the most like uh, domain-specific, expressive way to do the featureization, and then we train our models. During deployment, um, the same model is deployed to face this 
um, very low traffic online network data. So we look at this pipeline and uh, wonder, does it really work in the current networks? While the whole community has worked uh, on this topic for over a full decade, there are still a lot of obstacles. Yeah, it's uh, still quite challenging to operationalize such a like pipeline in networks. So let me share with you some of the challenges I observed. Um, like the first challenge is this accessibility to high quality network data set. So if we don't have this such data set, we cannot train powerful models. However, as a community, we do not have an equivalent of ImageNet as in computer vision community. So uh, all these network traces, packet captures, or some event logs, those are not very accessible. There are some open source data sets online, but they are often old and limited in their volume. Tech companies, they have a lot of data, but they just won't share them because of customer privacy, and they don't want people to analyze their internal systems. So essentially, we need to find a way to augment existing uh, network data set. The next challenge comes from this very large model inference workload in networks. Yeah, because um, for deploy deployed models, uh, like if you are an internet service provider or an enterprise, essentially you are facing a very distributed manner of uh, traffic. And is, that actually is like networks and networks. And this online network data rate can be very high in certain, on certain paths. For example, can be like tens of gig per second or even 100 gig per second. Still, we want to uh, run these models to deal with network security issues such as uh, intrusion detection. So these deployed models, um, they need to collaborate with each other. Yeah, just to face this very large model inference workload. The third challenge then is, is uh, constant changes of networks because networks are evolving systems. Yeah, we often see like these data patterns drift over time. For example, uh, some hardware being replaced, some software being upgraded here and there, and they all happen in a very asynchronous manner. Over time, yeah, we are seeing like this model's performance are decaying, and we need to monitor these results to to understand how when will they be uh, decaying and what's the reason for that, and then we update the uh, data for us to train like updated models. Yeah, so facing the challenges, my research is really about how to deal with them. And then also like uh, use the lessons learned for some uh, applications. So uh, to deal with challenge one, my my first thrust is uh, this like operational ML for networking. And uh, challenge one is a data scarcity issue. We explored using Gen AI techniques for synthetic network traces just to augment uh, the existing network data set. Yeah, in this data set we can then. Um, after augmenting them, we can help use them to train like a more um, capable model. Yeah, and I will briefly talk about this direction. Uh, the next challenge, like challenge two, is this huge machine learning workload on traffic analysis systems. So here I have three recent submissions, and I led one of it. That's a collaboration with uh, Stanford University, and I, I'd also like to talk in, in more depth on this manner. The third is about this model uh, decay over time problem. Yeah, and uh, together with Verizon, we uh, deploy in some like this assistance to deal with this uh, model decaying over time problem. I just detect when that's happening and explain and then do some mitigation. Uh, due to time limitations, I won't uh, talk about this uh, direction. But uh, yeah, if you're interested, uh, always, yeah. Uh, feel free to approach me uh, via email or uh, any any other means. Yeah. So my next for us is, is basically digital well-being and security. That's more uh, related to after I learned the lessons of how to build scalable and uh, like competent machine learning systems, 
I apply them on these like security problems. So for example, some of them are like in-home activity recognition and privacy uh, for a lot of network services such as uh, GPS, spoof, uh, GPS spoofing, attack and defense. And also recently I'm looking at language models, their system security and how to measure them. So yeah, if you are interested in this, like feel free to um, basically email me and we can chat uh, for half an hour. I'm very happy to do that. Cool. Um, so for today's content, I'll talk about uh, these the two, first two challenges. Um, and uh, I'll first briefly talk about, yeah, can we leverage Gen AI techniques to deal with this data scarcity problem in networking? Uh, the answer is yes, right? And uh, there are, these are pretty fresh uh, works from my lab, uh, and uh, I collaborate with uh, Chase Jiang, uh, Shi Jiang, and uh, basically, yeah, in um, these tasks, we are trying to use already pretty powerful diffusion models for us to augment network data set. And the biggest challenge for this type of task is that um, unlike images, yeah, where if you are generating a cat, it can be sitting in like different locations of this frame, this is a figure frame, but for network traffic generation, yeah, you have to follow these stateful machines designed by smart people a while back, and these network protocols, they, they should be followed uh, in, in certain rules. So yeah, how to like instruct these uh, diffusion models to help us to generate such uh, uh, data so that we can use this data to augment our um, models yeah, and then we can also like use it to test on like existing firewalls or stuff like that. So that's a major question we are exploring in these two um, quite fresh uh, publications. So before I dive into our system, yeah, and I want to first uh, like uh, yeah talk about this uh, network trace representation. Um, we use a representation that's quite standard nowadays. It's called mprint. So mprint is a way to represent like network packets and also flows. Yeah, in uh, like uh, essentially it's a constant length of uh, vectors. Yeah, it has a constant uh, dimensionality. So uh, how, how does it uh, convert existing network flows into it? So as you can see that here, in a typical imprint, yeah, it basically have uh, all these representations of uh, IPv4, TCP, UDP, SMP, and payload. Yeah, you can choose to have like any part of it. Like um, basically, there could be imprint of just IPv4 and TCP. Yeah, and for TCP, uh, yeah, for TCP here, yeah, you can see that basically it has a maximum number of 480 bits. With where each header field bits are considered as a feature. And um, you also have a bunch of like TCP options down there. If we don't have that option configured in the current packet, packet it will be padded to negative ones. So if it does not have, for example, UDP here, uh, let's, uh, let's think about this like a TCP IP uh, packet, all these uh, UDP features will be padded to be negative ones. Yeah, if it's like UDP, all these TCP packets will be padded into negative ones. So essentially, it's a very um, like standard way to have a very expressive um, like representation of network packet, and each packet would have like thousands of features after this uh, this visualization, and then also. Uh, for each flow, we may have multiple packets together. So um, this is a very powerful tool to, to begin with. And uh, based on this, what we're advocating in this Gen AI works we are doing are like, yeah, we are advocating for a text to traffic synthesis paradigm. The motivation is still like this data scarcity issue. Yeah. And our approach is to take this very uh, powerful 
existing uh, text to image diffusion model, such as the uh, stable diffusion, along some like this image representations of raw network traces. Yeah, and uh, essentially those are packet captures. So as I said earlier, the biggest challenge is to um, let the, the model to generate very control in a very controlled way and let them to follow these network protocols. For example, the first three packets of TCP should be like a three-way handshake. And also like the acknowledge numbers should be like in increasing incrementally. Right. So uh, what do we actually do? So to start with, we have these packet captures, which contains uh, one flow with multiple packets. And each packet, as you see earlier, it has like uh, thousands of features. Yeah, and they will transform this PCAP into like an image representation. Um, for example, here, um, let's ignore the text here for now. And uh, each row is one packet in the flow, and each column is one header field bit. Here you have one and zero, which are their original values. And these negative ones are gray, gray parts here. Essentially, that means uh, these are like the padded values inside. So this representation is actually quite interesting because now we can see like a fixed number of uh, packet and then how they uh, like have some constant bits across these packets in the flow. And this is uh, like a Netflix traffic. Yeah, we, we, are, we are seeing it. So after we transform this into this uh, representation, we can further let it to fine tune uh, like an existing diffusion model. And then after we get the art model, we in this uh, actual inference and data generation process, we use something called a control net. So a control net is basically extracting the edges of such representation. Yeah, so, so that you can see, yeah, there are some constant bits and it's sort of bounded in certain regions. It only generates uh, these like, for example, the first uh, several um, like 100-ish bits for IPv4. Yeah, and uh, nearly half of these TCP, TCP packet uh, header field bits. Yeah. And the, the, the good thing about using a control net is that after using that, you will only have this generated bits around these edges. So instead of like uh, generating all over the places, now it's regulated with certain shapes and certain like intuitions behind it, which is like, yeah, Netflix traffic will be configured using this type of uh, uh, information. And as this step, we can already transform it back to network traces. And uh, it can al al already give us like a very good augmentation of data because as you can see, these are like uh, perhaps more fuzzy than the original ones, but it is uh, sort of learned and it's uh, conformed to uh, such a distribution of Netflix traffic. So it's still kind of good and kind of useful. And then uh, we can already use it to help us to get a better um, like machine learning model. So the, it works like this. Um, basically, we can uh, use this generated network traffic um, to, to, to complement our existing uh, data sets. So for example, yeah, originally you may want to collect like 100% of data set. Yeah, and then you uh, train a machine learning mo model on it and get some accuracy of it. However, like getting this labeled data set is very hard, especially like for security tasks. Sometimes they secu uh, like some of these um, attack scenarios are quite rare. And then we can, uh, for example, take the, uh, we can only collect 5% of this network traffic and then train this um, like net diffusion model on it. Yeah, and then later we use it to generate the rest of the 95%. And still we can uh, get the same accuracy as we are training on this full real data set. Yeah, and uh, yeah, if they are tested on like this real uh, like network traces. So that's how we're going to choose it. Yeah, and 
we also take one step further. Yeah, we don't want to stop at this like uh, statistical similarity. We have some post generation heuristics to help us to, for example, fix 10% of the bit. Um, and then they now follow this um, network protocols. Yeah, and they can have this like inter or intra packet dependency across. And after that, when we transform it back to PCAPs, it can be used uh, on the existing network hardware. Yeah, uh, for example, we can use Warshark to analyze it. We can replay it into certain network port just to test on some like firewall policies. So my friend in Google, after I told him that we have this like uh, model to help you, like if you input Netflix traffic, that will just be generate on Netflix traffic. He is quite excited about this because oftentimes they need to build like firewalls or configure some firewall rules. However, it's really hard to get some uh, some of these particular um, like uh, traces. Yeah, for example, they, they have to recollect this uh, Netflix tra traces or some of its VPN traces. But now we tell them, yeah, we have this model. You you tell us um, some like um, text, and then we can um, generate this traffic for you, and then you can use it to test your firewalls. So that is the case. Um, well, yeah, this uh, this, is, this is about this like uh, Net Diffusion work, and uh, we are open sourcing every everything about it, and you can check our website, blog, and also we have uh, um, already paper published. So if you are interested in it, uh, using like a Gen AI technique to augment your existing uh, like network data set, this will be like a handy tool for you. Great. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the uh, next question. Um, yeah. Facing this very large amount of data volumes, we still want to keep pace up, right? And how do we actually make this very accurate and efficient model system co-design for network traffic analysis? Here, uh, this is our main dish today. I will talk about it uh, in depth. And I'll talk about Surflow. It's a real-time system. And we discovered some very interesting dynamics of uh, when we are trying to design a model and system together, yeah, there are some co-optimization happening there. This is a work in submission, um, but uh, I'm pretty proud of it, so I'm I'm going to talk about it. And uh, yeah, the conferences we submitted to they allow us to talk at like local institutes. So yeah, that's a, that's a case. Um, it's called a fast low model architecture for network traffic analysis. So we, we're seeing that already, like there are many network traffic analysis you, using increasingly complex data-driven models. Yeah, and uh, they actually have a very high requirement on their latency and throughput. So uh, here are some tasks, for example, like service recognition, try to see whether it's traffic is from YouTube, Netflix, or Zoom. Yeah, because more and more traffic are getting encrypted. And the previous approaches of uh, uh, trying to detect it is just uh, no longer working. Like uh, SNIs are being encrypted and stuff. And yeah, essentially we would need to have a machine learning model to tell you what flow is what application so that people can do some management tasks on them, uh, such as flow prioritization, trying to allocate a more fair bandwidth for different applications. Mm, and also like device identifications, yeah, because uh, if you are an internet service provider, essentially it's very hard to get uh, what device each flow is about. Um, like this label is really hard to get uh, sitting on an ISP. So uh, if we can get the label just based on this uh, um, packet behaviors, yeah, we, we can then tell for example, some devices, they have some vulnerabilities. So we just don't want uh, their, they, they keep the communication with uh, 
outside of this space. So we can build some firewall rules around that certain device. And the next um, like application is this um, measurement of quality of experience on encrypted traffic, because uh, many kind of uh, like uh, streaming videos or video conference apps, this type of applications, their like application layer um, protocols are being encrypted. And uh, still, we want to make, uh, get a sense of what the quality of the experience there is. And uh, therefore, when you do this kind of uh, network traffic analysis, just on encrypted traffic. So um, all these classification tasks, they are often used for traffic management or like mm, firewall management type of tasks. This requires a very fast reaction time. Yeah, for example, in order to do this flow prioritization, service recognition needs to happen in real time with a latency of under 50 milliseconds. For other tasks like network intrusion detection, yeah, decisions need to be made really quick, yeah, as fast as possible to prevent damages. And um, here we can see a typical machine-based traffic analysis system. Uh, especially on the inference side, it really contains three stages. So the first stage is flow collection. Yeah, it first needs to collect the packets in the flow, which will provide them enough context. Then these flows are converted into numerical features, such as flow statistics or more comprehensive raw header field bits. Yeah, these features are uh, input to the model for inference, which will return a classification result. There are many existing serving pipelines. Yeah, that's designed for decreases uh, uh, inference cost. Yeah, it makes sense for many non-networking tasks because they are facing this uh, very like a uh, non-streaming inputs. Uh, for example, language models. Now we see. Yeah, the models are becoming more and more like gigantic. Yeah, it's uh, sitting across tens of GPUs. But for the inputs, at best, it's like uh, tens of books or or slightly more. Yeah, but it's uh, it's not a lot on their actual data volume. So it makes sense that people are like optimizing for a lower inference cost. For example, this. They do model pruning, quantization, um, knowledge distillation, hardware accelerations on this. For networking tasks, though, um, the workload is kind of reversed. Yeah, many times, at least for the applications I just mentioned, it can be uh, like solved by a quite small model. Yeah, sometimes the gradient boosting machine is better than deep neural networks. But the inputs are very large. Essentially, you are facing like tens of gig, uh, like hundreds of gig bed per second. That's very large, yeah. Still, people made a lot of like uh, mm, optimization efforts on like trying to make more efficient modeling, have feature selections, and run it on specialized hardware, just like uh, SmartNix. For this task uh, to to happen, yeah, uh, the previous ex like methods need to wait for four to one hundred packets, or even the entire flow before they can make a model inference. We look at this pipeline and we ask ourselves one question: Is it really the model inference cause of uh, the largest bottleneck in network traffic analysis? So yeah, let's explore this question together. Empirically, yeah, there are reasons behind why people want to collect more context. Um, in this context, is like packets. It essentially increases the model performance. For example, for like an eleven class classification problem on service recognition, yeah, if we increase the number of packets from one packet to five to ten across multiple models, here we are seeing it, the increase the F one scores. Um, like they have a jump here, right? And it essentially 
help you to have a better uh, performance on this task. But is it really worth it to wait for more packets? We found that actually no. Yeah, there's a big gap between waiting for the packet and uh, the, the time you actually need it to do the inference. So let me dive in a little bit more. On the left side, we have this flow collection time. Yeah, it's uh, basically uh, waiting for like the second packet, fifth packet, or tenth packet to come. And you can see that in this uh, CDF plot, the median waiting time for the second packet is already 10 millisecond. Yeah, for this uh, tenth packet to come, the, the median of it can be hundreds of milliseconds or even thousands of it. And it can be up to 10 to the power of six. Yeah, that's a lot of waiting time. And what about the actual feature computation time and inference time? So those are actually a lot smaller on the scale. So for example, we have this feature computation time and this model inference time across different models. Let's only look at the first packet's um, inference and uh, yeah, the process and inference. They are in the scale of 10 to the power of negative two millisecond, which means like the tens of microseconds. Yeah. So there exists an opportunity here, which is that oftentimes, yeah, we after we get one packet, we can make a prediction on it already, and then we still uh, will need to wait a very large amount of time to get the next packet to come. So this is a very interesting opportunity for us. The next observation we have is that even for just first packet inference, the inference time across models, they can differ largely. Yeah. So uh, still for the service recognition task, here we have five models and we have uh, like this um, trade-off of F1 score, which is uh, basically accuracy and inference time, the latency. Yeah, the deeper green here means that it has a better performance, model performance. The deeper blue here means it has a better like latency, yeah, has a, a lower latency. So you can see that the best model is the light GBM here. Um, it's not necessarily the slowest model. Yeah, and the quickest model, the same tree here, like got a good result. Yeah, it's an okay result for the test to, to run in real time. And this holds true for the rest of two tasks, device identification, um, video conferencing app, QoE me measurement. And that shows us a very interesting search space for us to optimize on, like between the, the accuracy and the latency. So these are very interesting two observations. They all show like this operational cost across different types of models. Based on these observations, can we actually design a better system by solving this right bottleneck? Yeah, we want to get comparable result as you are running like this conventional approaches, but we want to have a much lower end-to-end -end low latency and a higher service rate. So here I want to introduce to you uh, this, the fast low model architecture. The idea is trying to optimize the balance between speed and accuracy. So on the one end of the spectrum, just like what people are used to do in the past, we have a complex model which waits for the optimal amount of um, packet to come. And then, yeah, and it essentially runs low, but it can give you like a um, pretty accurate analysis. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the simplest model with an okay result. Yeah, which only uses one packet. So how about we use this quick fuck model, yeah, as a filter. We let it run across uh, through all of this traffic. Yeah, and then we try to distinguish, okay, I'm satisfied with this route, I'm not, yeah. And uh, yeah, we only have this uh, selected flows sent to the slow model uh, for a more accurate analysis. You may wonder why would this be beneficial? Because in this way, we offload a lot of workload from the traditional approaches to a much faster model. 
So it avoids waiting for more packets to come or more inference time. And it's also quite interesting on um, when it will be beneficial. Because yeah, if you are seeing like two models, one faster and one slow, they have a significant disparity in their operational cost. And their performance also relatively are different. We can use fast low model architecture then. Yeah. So the design of third flow essentially uses two fast low disparity opportunities. Um, it optimizes on both this first packet inference time and the flow collection time, which is packet waiting time. Right. And uh, it is like that. The pipeline is like this. We have the massive traffic coming in and extracted into a first packet feature, and we put them into uh, the first queue. Yeah. In the first queue, we use the fasting model on this uh, first packet feature first. Uh, so that like the majority of the flows are um, like passing passing through, and maybe we are already satisfied it, with it. And uh, if we are not satisfied with it, we will just uh, put it into the best model on this uh, first packet, which is uh, still pretty fast because it does not need to wait uh, for for other packets to come. Yeah, even if we already processed these two models. For the majority of the time, we still need to wait for uh, other packets to come. So for the next Q to M packets, they will be saved into Q2. Yeah, and they will cross match with this like unsatisfied flow keys together. And then some of them will be uh, put into this um, four packets low model inference, which was uh, like the conventional model people like to use. Yeah. So this is this, uh, essentially third flow. In order to support this uh, design of it, we have a sophisticated traffic management system built um, just to maintain the network states and extract features and stuff. And for each queue, we use something called a message broker as the implementation approach. Yeah, so all these features are coming in and then they will be uh, like routed to certain type of uh, devices across heterogeneous hardware and different cores of the same devices. Yeah, and you can also specify how, how many numbers of cores on this uh, should be. So it also supports parallelism. And you, you may also wonder, yeah, how, how would the user interact with, uh, with Surflow? For the user here, we basically mean like network operators, uh, if we want, they want to get some insights on the traffic flows, and then also for um, some like researchers like us, yeah, we probably want to use Surflow to build more efficient systems. And Surflow does all the dirty work for you. It extracts these m features, this full head fill bits using C++. So it's uh, like extracting it on a line rate. Um, yeah, it's pretty efficient. And users, they would train models in their favorite Python library, uh, such as Torch, TensorFlow, which I do not recommend anymore, and uh, um, Scikit-learn, <laughs> XGBoost, LightGVM, this type of uh, models. Yeah, and then users will need to specify a single inference task by writing 10 lines of code, and then also the amount of hardware they want it to run. Surflow then convert all these models into uh, like uh, like a uniform um, format called Onyx that's supported by Microsoft. Yeah, so that it can then be deployed across heterogeneous hardware with any number of consumers specified by the user. You can run it either in fast C++ serving uh, pipelines, or you can also run it on Python. Yeah, because some of these libraries are only available in Python. So, yeah, so here's also like one question remained unanswered, uh, which is like, yeah, it's also very important. Um, it's like from this fast and slow model, uh, how do I know which of these classification results I'm satisfied or not? So here we, we also explore some of flow assignment algorithms. Uh, the idea is that we don't want to use any ground truth labels. We wanted to 
uh, like just solely based on the fast models output. Yeah, we want to know whether this prediction is good enough. So um, what do we do? The secret sauce here is that is a, a metric called uncertainty. Yeah. So this uncertainty score is quite interesting because um, instead of you let this fast model to output the exact label of, uh, of a prediction, we let it to give us this probability vector. Yeah. So that based on this vector, we can um, compute the entropy on it so that we know how confident the fast model is on that. If it is uh, confident enough, then we are good with it. Yeah, then we just say, okay, this might be good enough. If it is not, we, we then send it to the slow model. The next algorithm is more advanced. It's based on this per class uncertainty threshold. This is mainly because like for different classes, some models are more confident on some classes, some models are not. So essentially we want to have a different threshold for different classes. And here we have a uh, um, computed uh, validation set. Yeah, this is calculated on the portions for assigned correct and in incorrect predictions. So what does it mean? It means that we want to assign the, like when we assign a flow prediction to the slow model, we want it to be mostly incorrect predictions so that the slow model can help to correct it, right? Then we use this like uh, answering threshold to do that. Cool, uh, you may wonder how good this is. Uh, let me show you some evaluation result. There are three tasks. We, we explore like service recognition, device identification, and it's also QOE measurement. The third one is a little bit different as it is a con continuous classification. The first two ones are more like, yeah, classifying on the first um, packet or like the first X packet. And we have a test bed where we can um, specify the number of new flows per second. And it's uh, running on a 16 core CPU, which is pretty uh, accessible to in most of our lab environment. So we compare against two baseline. One is called best effort. So for the best effort, uh, it's essentially everything is uh, implemented in C++. We make an immediate prediction after features being extracted. And then uh, the next one is called queuing. So when the traffic comes much faster than the model inference, one, one way is to do it like best effort, discard some of them. One is like uh, to save them in a queue. So, so that like later this model can um, infer on it. Yeah. For queuing itself is essentially serve flow without fast flow and uh, uh, assignment algorithm. So here comes some, some results I want to share with you. Uh, it's basically like, yeah, serve flow. The requirement is that we want it to be um, as accurate as some traditional approaches where you are collecting like um, n packets, right? Yeah, but but still, even if we match that like accuracy, we can still get high service rate, low end-to-end -end latency, and low miss rate. So the, the configuration here is the old service recognition, and we have decision tree LGBM for the first packet. We have like LGBM for the tenth packet, for the first ten packets. So uh, here, the first thing I want to share with you is a single consumer, which is single CPU uh, service rate. And the x-axis is the traffic rate, which means how many new flows come in per second. And the y-axis is the service rate, which means how many classifications we can make um, per second. So ideally, uh, this, this should match with each other because, uh, yeah, if they match, it basically means that we are serving on all of these flows in real time yeah you can see that we have two ideal lines for like first uh, first packet and the 10 packets mainly because that for a lot of flows yeah they are mice flows they just like do not have uh, 10 packets so essentially for like best effort and queuing it's impossible for them to achieve such a service rate that, like that's uh, like on every every flow and you can see that serve flow essentially achieves like uh, 4.1K flows per second on this uh, classification rate, like uh, rate, yeah. And 
also from the perspective of end-to-end -end latency, you can see that third flow is good, uh, like almost uh, a lot better than most of the, the other two baseline because most of the traffic here only need to collect one packet. Yeah, but for the rest of them, they need to collect all the 10 packets. And even worse for the queuing, once it's getting congested, the the like latency will explode exponentially mm, becoming larger. Yeah. So the last thing is uh, about this miss rate. Uh, by miss rate, I mean um, what portion of these flows are not being classified. For third flow, we're always uh, classifying on them because yeah, if the the first packet appears, we we make a pred prediction. But for the next two ones, since some of them just do not have uh, 10 packets, so they can never make a prediction on them. And uh, there are also, also like the best effort. You can see this miss rate is also getting higher at this um, some point when the capacity gets more saturated. That's mainly because, yeah, it just can, cannot keep up. So we have to discard some of these uh, flows in it. If we break it down to the actual latency here, we can also see that for the end-to-end -end latency, like uh, third flow is able to accelerate uh, three quarters of this entirety of flows. And yeah, we can make a prediction um, as a millisecond level, like uh, under 15 milliseconds. And if we break it down to different stages, you can see like from collection, visual compute, queuing inference, and end-to-end. -end. Now the third flow, especially on the collection time and feature compute time, these are minimal. And it is then like the end-to-end -end latency is bounded by the queuing latency, which is uh, the price we have to pay in order to manage such a, like the network traffic in, in this queuing manner. Yeah. For queuing itself, you can, you can also see it's, uh, it's bounded by the queuing latency as well, because at this rate, it is already congested. So the end-to-end -end latency is very much bounded. And for the best effort, uh, because it does not have this queuing latency, so the majority of latency comes from the collection time where it has to uh, wait for a lot of packets. Surf flow is also able to like um, scale. Yeah. So on a single 16 core uh, CPU server, we can make predictions really fast, like uh, on 50K new flows per second. That essentially matches this uh, scale of uh, traffic at the network city, uh, like a city network backbone. And it only happens on like a 16 core CPU server. So it's quite quite usable. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I want to show you is this uh, flow assignment performance, um, where we design this, to, this like uh, uh, uncertain based um, like algorithm for us to tell which of these uh, predictions are incorrect, and then we, we put it to the, to the slow model. So here we have an uh, upper bound, which is called an oracle. It's basically assigning these flows based on uh, ground truth knowledge. If we, like, it assumes that we know it for sure that uh, some of these flows are incorrect predictions. Yeah, so we only send these like, incorrect predictions into the slow model. And here are also random ones, uh, which is the, like, yeah, randomly assign these flows uh, from fast to slow model. And there are also a uh, third flow, which is a combination of uh, uncertainty and per cost uncertainty based on their, their, their model. So yeah, here I want to show you this figure, which is a very interesting figure. Uh, it shows that uh, third flow is able to achieve like, like with only assigning 24% of the flow, we got the same result as we are running all the flows on a slow model. So uh, how does it work? So on the y-axis is F1 score. Uh, this point is essentially running everything from a fast model. Uh, this point is running everything in using a slow model. And we can see that for the random ones, it, it, the accuracy um, increases uh, incrementally. Yeah, and it's like the linearly. And uh, for the oracle here, it's basically the upper bound. It means that like, yeah, we, we want to be as close as uh, to the like the left upper corner of this uh, this figure. And third flow is good at pushing pushing it 
uh, towards the direction of uh, Oracle. Yeah, and we, and we can already make it um, pretty, pretty good. Yeah. So one interesting observation is that for the Oracle, yeah, it first grows up and then it dips back into this uh, slow model uh, like prediction. Yeah, why would that happen? Uh, that's because for many of these fast models, they can already, like on certain samples, they can make some correct uh, predictions. Yeah, but when later it is sent to the slow model, uh, like this, uh, this prediction is then disagreed with the slow model. So that becomes false, uh, like uh, when we're actually doing the final prediction, like aggregating their prediction together. Yeah, so it's uh, it's, it's something we want to avoid, but it, at least it shows there's a very interesting phenomenon, which is that even if you have the best knowledge of everything, yeah, you want to um, like assign the least amount of flows to the slow model, both to get the best like system performance and model performance, right? So um, finally comes to the takeaway um, slide. Here we have, uh, yeah, Surflow is essentially a scalable system across heterogeneous hardware and it achieves all, the, all of these good things uh, by offloading uh, like workload to a uh, fast model. And the key bottleneck we found in our traffic analysis is this flow collection time. Yeah, that's we develop this novel fast low model serving architecture to deal with this bottleneck. And uncertainty is a very good metric for flow classification assignment. Yeah, especially when people want to intelligent choose uh, which classification request you want to assign from one model to another without any like uh, computation, large computation overhead because uh, uncertainty is very too easy to compute. It's just like one formula over a, a like probability vector. So it's uh, it's quite quite easy to uh, to compute it. Do, uh, coming back to this slide, this is about my research. And uh, if you're interested in them, yeah, feel free to email me and uh, we can we can discuss more about them. And thanks for your attention. Yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, uh, Shannon, for really like a very, I would say, uh, enlightening uh, presentation and for sharing your uh, deep insights into um, machine learning within uh, network environments. And as we transition into our Q&A session, uh, I would like to pose maybe a, a couple of follow-up questions to further maybe explore some of the topics we, you've discussed. And right. for our audience, uh, please feel free to submit your questions as well. Uh, I'll actually start from questions that we received from uh, the emails. So uh, the first question is how to share or reuse surflow generated models? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Actually, we are in the process of open sourcing the whole pipeline. And we want to dockerize it so people can deploy it very easily. And uh, if we want to share or reuse this, uh, uh, generating models, I think we can, yeah, also use some existing infras to do that, like uh, upload them on Hugging Face. It's just maybe several lines of code to just post all these models, um, like and submit them on a certain like a uh, hub, a uh, central hub there, so people can can reuse all of this. And uh, that's actually a very good idea. I can, yeah, let me think more about it. And we can, we can, yeah, we can make that happen. Sure. Um, I'll just maybe go through the questions and then, you know, uh, if you want to take them uh, home, you know, and then answer via email or have a discussion with the audience, feel free. Um, yeah. So uh, another question is concerning learning with less data. What is the role of feature engineering? Does it occur? Uh, does it incur costs in the model? Um, there have been many applications, at least more than 20 in recent years, based on my understanding of using uh, CTGAN uh, um, to generate new network data, particularly for intrusion detection. 
Uh, could you provide a brief comparison between your approach, NAND diffusion, and uh, CTGAN, uh, if you're familiar with it? Thank you. So this is a long question, but uh, you can eventually yeah. find it in the chat as well. Sure, sure. So uh, I'll, I'll answer it briefly. So yeah, the, the role of feature engineering is uh, still important because uh, a lot of time we are saying uh, some most important features can contribute the most to the uh, like these accuracies. Uh, and uh, also by using smaller amount of features, we can get uh, like more efficient uh, like predictions out of it. So that's good. That's uh, actually one opportunity we can use for building this fast model because the goal is to make it as fast as possible. Um, but one thing I observed that uh, is because we use this imprint like um, representation, yeah, it has thousands of features. So it has a better performance um, when we are just using one um, packet alone. So that is actually a prior for us to, to make Circular work better. Because uh, if we cannot have like OK result, then like we cannot um, basically filter out the majority of the flows at the very beginning. So it is a trade-off there. And the other, the next question is also quite interesting. It's about comparing the diffusion approaches with the scan based approaches. Yeah, indeed, this is a very interesting com uh, com comparison. And in the paper, we combine it uh, very, in very much depth. So the basic, uh, the, the biggest difference is that, um, like for net diffusion, it is able to generate traffic with uh, thousands of uh, like header field bits at the same time. But for like uh, game based approaches, uh, the most, uh, the best approach in the like a lot of time, like ago, yeah, maybe two years ago, yeah. And uh, those are used to generate um, tens of like features for one time step or for one packet most. So you can see like this granularity is uh, deferred very largely, yeah. And then also um, another thing um, compared to GAM is our advantages on like completely uh, compliant with network protocols. For GAM based approaches, it's just like um, some flowing metrics. Those are not really having this like um, very rigorous check on their um, like semantics of network traffic. Yeah. So, so that is the major differences. Uh, feel free to check out our paper. Um, yeah, we have a more in-depth comparison there. Perfect. So bear with me. We have a few more questions coming from the email. Um, so another one is um, the following. mPrint contains vectors with different dimensions. What about the payload? Is the new PCAP in the same context or a different context? Yeah, that's also a good question. So for imprint, um, when we are using it for one model, it's always in the same dimensionality. Yeah. So if if that the specific bit is not there, we just like add it to be negative ones. Yeah. For payloads, if we are interested in it, uh, we can we can also put it there. But the the yeah. In all this work, we are not putting payloads in them because of like this. A lot of the payloads are encrypted these days, yeah, and it's super hard to to decode them and make any meaningful uh, like features out of it. So so that we just do not use payloads, yeah, and uh, um, yeah, like the third third one is the new pickup in the same context or different context. I'm assuming this is a. Uh, asking about the net diffusion work. It is in the same context because uh, um, it is a text conditioned generation um, from from the diffusion pipeline. Like, uh, yeah, we already know this is Netflix and we input Netflix traffic. So it will generate some Netflix traffic. Mm -hmm. Um, then, then it's like another one using uh, Gen AI to generate network traffic is beneficial, but how does it differ from protocol fuzzing? Yeah, that's a good question as well. So I'm not an expert on protocol fuzzing, but uh, 
I think they are used for different techniques or different end goals. For protocol fuzzing, I'm assuming that it's like trying to increase the reliability of different network protocols and trying to make it like uh, more robust. Again, some of this um, maybe uh, like malicious behaviors or some very rare cases. Yeah. And that does not involve uh, this, uh, basically this um, like uh, machine learning models to be there. Like we, we can also use some, some machine learning to generate these fuzzing cases, but uh, yeah, that, maybe that's less explored. For the Gen AI approach, uh, we are the exploring here, especially trying to uh, give uh, like people the more of the autonomy on getting more data. So uh, essentially we want to like use those to help people to train better models uh, for different purposes. And these purposes are uh, like designed or basically they are um, a lot of needs from um, from like other 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 like enterprises and stuff and they can use it to to uh, like share their internal choices yeah with uh, more of a privacy guarantee that, that's something we're exploring right now yeah and it's more like an approach to like uh, also augment our research community in a sense Yes, thank you. Um, there are, uh, I would say, two more questions that came uh, via email, and then I'm seeing that um, the audience wants to open, uh, you know, the conversation. So let's try to do that in a few minutes. So another question is for service and device identification. How can this be detected uh, using traffic flow? Right. Yeah, that's also like a good question. So. We build models to detect those. And uh, the intuition behind this is that, for example, for different services like YouTube and uh, Netflix traffic, those are, if you wanted to run on like current uh, like network, um, these applications need to be configured on their um, maybe like TCP options, their IPv4 options in certain ways. Which gives us like a very interesting signature on what type of services they they really are, and uh, in like implement this type of uh, um, these approaches. Yeah, we we actually didn't do um, feature selection for for the part of it because we just know that at most we can have four hundred eighty bits, and then we pad all of this possible amount of options into it and then yeah later uh like if the, it has uh, the value then it's uh, in the right place if it does not have that it does not exist it just never works mm -hmm. good um so another question is how feature selection affects server flow performance yeah yeah so yeah i think it's similar to one of the questions uh earlier it's just like well, definitely it will have some effects on it. And uh, um, it can, like with the more selective features, we can get the f faster model even faster. Um, but our intuition is that, yeah, the performance of the fast model need to be good enough and with using just one packet. And we sort of want to use more expressive approaches in when we are doing this uh, fast um, prediction. So so that's why we didn't explore more about this feature selection strategies in there. But if you are interested in uh, feature selection, I have another paper collaborated with uh, Stanford University and also like uh, um, it's called Cato. It's also on archive. Feel free to just look at it on my website and we can, yeah, if you have any questions, we can, we can talk about that later. Yeah. Uh, Perfect. Thank you so much. And the last, since um, we have a uh, Farouk who raised the hand for, uh, I would say, for five minutes. So Farouk, please, you can, um, you know, open your mic and ask your question. Um, yeah. But at the same time, I'm seeing that uh, he posted in the chat. What is the feature selection strategy for padded bits? So maybe I can just. Yeah, I, I sort of already answered that, and uh, yeah, 
um, Farouk, and uh, yeah, I hope I pronounce it correctly. And uh, feel free to to ask me any questions. Yeah, open your mind and choose. Perfect. Thank you so much, Shinan, uh, for this really, uh, you know, insightful presentation and uh, taking all the questions uh, that were many at this stage. Uh, so really, thank you for sharing your expertise uh, with us today. We really greatly appreciate uh, your contributions for um, actually to advancing our understanding of machine learning in uh, network environments. Uh, so to everyone who joined us, uh, thank you for your participation. If you're interested interested in attending your um, actual next session, please register by following the link on the uh, website. Uh, we we'll look forward to seeing you there. And until then, take care and uh, keep exploring the possibilities within cyber forensics and threat investigation. Bye-bye.